Earlier in the fall, the students in my fourth form English classes read an essay in which point of view played a significant role. It is key to understanding the idea that the writer Cherokee Paul McDonald makes about understanding the situation in which we might find ourselves. The essay is entitled A View from the Bridge, and it is told from the point of view of a grown man who one day comes to a startling realization about a little kid he encounters while he was out for a run. The man did not really get what was going on with this boy until some time had passed, and then he came to understand what had been going on, only when he was able to truly see the truth of the matter. I'll expect you to track down the essay and read it yourself to learn the ending. Ask any of the fourth formers to borrow his copy of Models for Writers. I'm sure he'd be glad to lend it to you. My intention this morning, however, is not to focus on the story's plot, but rather on point of view. We see and hear and feel from, from the point of view of the narrator. It is what we call a first-person limited narrator. Were the story to have been told to us from a little kid's point of view, that too, in all likelihood, would also be a first-person limited narrator, but a different narrator in a different point of view. The man on the run perceived what was going on around him. The little kid might have looked at it altogether differently. And were there other characters, they might have considered the circumstances in entirely different ways. As many of you know already, learning about and understanding and accepting different points of view permits us a much greater, a much more meaningful level of understanding and appreciation. Now you may have wondered why Amos and Tony and Zach are up here this morning. I have asked Tony to play for us for two reasons, both of which are connected somewhat tangentially to the theme of this chapel talk. The first is his obvious musical talent on an instrument most of us do not get a chance to hear very often, if at all. The other is the fact that Tony brings to our school an upbringing and family background that represents a different point of view. Amos and Zach, I asked them to join us for an oddly coincidental reason. Amos and Zach and I all arrived at the hilltop at approximately the same time. I moved to Salisbury School in August of 1998, and the two of them were born within days of one another that same month. From these three guys, we are presented with widely different points of view. Those of you who know these three, who have spoken to and listened to them, will appreciate their collective point of view and their individually respective points of view. One is not better or worse, they are all different. Now I want to speak to you a little bit frankly for a minute, and in doing so, please realize that I have no intention of being disrespectful or insulting. Rather, I hope to nudge you a little bit and attempt you, in an attempt to get you to consider a slightly different point of view, one that has nothing to do with literature or class. As I was relishing the time I had with my own family these past few days, I gained a greater deeper appreciation of how, of how they have shifted the focus in their lives. No longer children in a chronological sense, these four young adults are focusing on their own kids, their own nieces, and their own nephews. And while they surely remain my own children, I seem to be drawn to the five grandchildren. That is what parents who become grandparents do. For most of your lives, the focus has been on you, as it ought to have been. Because you are who you are, at the ages you are now, you spend most of your time thinking about and talking about yourself. Not only do you yourselves think and talk about you, but your parents do too. And that, for the most part, is a good thing. As I just mentioned a moment ago, it is what parents are supposed to do. From the youngest third formers in the back to the oldest six formers up here in the front, Every student in this chapel is here because someone, most likely his parents or sometimes his grandparents, feels a Salisbury School education will be beneficial for you. And I contend that in order for you to truly benefit from this experience, you have to spend some time hearing and understanding what the adults in your life expect of you. I'm going to lean heavily on the thinking and writing of a woman named Wendy Mogul, a clinical psychologist from Los Angeles. Dr. Mogul has articulated far more effectively than I some of the basic tenets of raising and teaching self-reliant, 
self-sufficient, self-starting, self-confident children. Earlier in her book entitled The Blessings of a Skinned Knee, she lists the following objectives. Listen carefully to see how many of them echo lessons you have heard and learned at Salisbury in classrooms, in this chapel, from this pulpit, and as we sing, at school meetings, in dormitories, in team meetings, and in conversations with the adults around here. They are. We want you to know that you are unique and ordinary at the same time. We expect you to treat others honorably. We want you to be resilient, self-reliant, and courageous. We want you to be appreciative of what you have, knowing that there are an awful lot of people in this world who don't have anything. We want you to work hard at everything you do. We want you to know and accept rules and to exercise self-control. And as Duane Estes and several others have reminded you, we want you to appreciate the preciousness of the present moment, the carpe diem, the seize the day. These are lofty ideals, but nonetheless they're what guide us and also guide your parents. Perhaps if I borrow another parallel from Dr. Mogul to illustrate the point further, I would use this metaphor. Our job, the job that George Emerson Quayle envisioned when he founded this school on this hilltop in 1901, the job his successors have upheld ever since, the job your parents expect, us, expect of us is to teach you how to swim in a proverbial sense. By the time you graduate from Salisbury School, the ex that expectation from the point of view and every adult in this chapel is that you will all be able to swim. As much as they and we may want to help you, as much as they and we may want to keep you in a life jacket, as much as they, as much as they and we may want to keep our hand on your belly as you splash and flail around in the water, what they and we all really want is that you will learn to swim by yourself. And if I might extend that metaphor along the way to learning how to swim, you may get scared. And you may get a snoop full of water. And you may get tired. And you may get frustrated. But all those moments of fear and discomfort and disappointment will only make you a better swimmer. So I ask you to consider this shift in perspective, to move away from this point of, view, point of view for a moment, and to think about the point of view of others. Perhaps by doing that, each one of you will have a clearer understanding of why you are here today, of what is expected of you while you are here, and where you might be tomorrow. Let's enjoy the day, boys.